Hi, welcome to the lecture for Module 1. This serves as the reading review of Unit 1, which can be found on pages 19 through 37. So the reason why um, this, this guide is kind of awesome, because it, it goes through uh, not just things regarding um, special education in regards to um, the actual curriculum development, but it also goes into other factors that need to be considered, especially if you're an elementary teacher or if you are in a secondary settings where uh, you may see other factors that are impacting students' overall well-being, especially since um, we all know that we have to serve the whole student. Um, and this sometimes means, you know, taking a closer look at um, how their impairments may be um, supported or uh, supported or I would say um, served within a school setting or if there are other factors that are weighing in um, that need additional services for example at my school we have um, social workers and there are other uh, services that are actually within our building to help the student so um, for me, I'm, I'm diligently working towards noticing and seeing what I see to ensure that I'm assessing my students properly, even at the high school level, because um, it is our job to help support them. So um, chapter one or unit one goes through uh, barriers to learning, impairment, social view of disability, which I think is very important. Um, that's why we start the conversation off in this classroom with uh, what do you think and how do you feel and what do you believe when it comes to includes inclusion and disability? And then reducing disabilities, deprivation, why should we try to reduce the deprivations or why bother? Right to participation, right to education that goes over some of the history of the laws and also implications for teachers, teacher reactions and the review of the entire unit. So I um, also strategically made sure to incorporate some of the questions that they have asked as our questions on the quiz. The reading quiz will reflect everything that's in um, this particular unit. Following, I'll incorporate some aspects from the other parts of the handbook, um, but I'm trying to be conscious of your um, time and also how much you actually can, how much you're able to cognitively process. So, uh, lecture overview is really simple. We'll cover three things. One, the review of the unit. Two, reading um, highlights. And then three, lecture wrap up, which is a video that's about 15 minutes. Um, but the video is actually worth viewing because it takes you in a different school settings and different scenarios and shows you um, how teachers are um, responding to their inclusive settings, which I think are really critical uh, for us to be able to grow our skills skills and differentiating within these environments. So unit one, um, I've already kind of went over some of these things, but it goes over barriers to children's learning that come from impairments and deprivation, ways of reducing learning difficulties that children may experience if they have disabilities, common deprivations that children experience and how they can be overcome through uh, nutritious food, uh, health, healthy environments, love and attention, and then the rights to social inclusion and to education as expressed in various international dec declarations. And then the fifth thing the, uh, this uh, unit covers is the implications for teachers in their everyday practice and developing more inclusive schooling. So uh, I thought this chapter was pretty interesting as it does a great job at talking about the perspectives of disabilities. Um, and there were two quotes that I picked out in particular. An impairment need not hold children back. Disability need not be a handicap. So I think sometimes we um, unfortunately use the disability to describe and define the student as opposed to it being just a factor that um, is a part of their personality. And I'm not saying that we should not name um, when students are disabled or when students are challenged with a disabi disability, but what I am saying is that's not odd to them. So that's one of the things I had to learn. My first uh, couple of years, I was uh, tasked with being a um, paired with an inclusive teacher. So I had a co-teacher and in my inclusive setting, and I didn't really understand. I have read the uh, Law of Disability Act uh, released in 2004, but I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, and it took me a while to learn how to um, decrease the impacts of 
impairments that students have with my um, teaching abilities. And I'm still working towards that today. So it says many of the disabling effects of impairments can be reduced if children have the opportunity to one, to interact with peers and adults in their community. Um, two, to experience a range of environments which minimize the impact of their impairment, such as buildings that have no steps. Um, that's something you can't kind of change within your school, but you can petition if you don't have a rail uh, for um, students with disabilities, or a ramp for them to come up, um, you could ask about that, and then or a petition to uh, delegate funding towards that. And then the third thing is to be taught by parents and teachers who help them to learn new skills. So the main point in the perspectives is is that the disability should not define a student and should not limit a student, which we all know we should always be working towards an inclusive education setting. So inclusive education acknowledges that all children can learn and that all need some form of support and learning. And that applies to most students who haven't been officially diagnosed. However, it's very important for us to keep this in mind for students who have been diagnosed and do have an IEP or 504 plan. Um, inclusive education aims to uncover and minimize barriers to learning. So that mean, aims means that every single day or every year you're working towards doing this better. Inclusive education is uh, broader than formal schooling and includes the home, the community, and other opportunities for child for education outside of schools. I think, um, especially with students who, and parents who may be challenged with different diagnoses that the students get, um, I think it's important for us to consider ways to partner with the community and to better serve students and or find services for them um, that goes beyond the classroom setting or, or maybe um, integrates uh, skills that they need to learn from both the uh, physical classroom and then at home. So for example, I have a friend who has a child who is autistic. And one of the things that he struggles with is expression of emotion. So if he gets angry, he goes into an angry rant and then he breaks things. So one of the recommendations I have for her was to find um, a class that teaches uh, kids on how to manage their anger. And the reason why I suggested that is because my niece too has some learning disabilities that are um, um, associated with her emotions. So one of the things that I noticed my sister do was incorporate, um, she found a school that actually had a class where they taught them how to manage their emotions. So if those services are not within the school, seeing a student have behavior outbursts hey, why not recommend, you know, different services that may assist them um, to dealing with the challenges of their emotions so that they can develop healthier ways to express themselves. Um, so that's what I mean by um, it's about changing attitudes, behaviors, teaching methods, curricular environments to meet the needs of all children. Um, also, inclusive education is a dynamic process which is constantly evolving according to local cultures and contexts, and it is part of the wider strategy to promote an inclusive society. Um, so it's not just about the classroom, it's about us as a society, as a community, trying to better ourselves and how we serve each other. Um, and it's not just that students bad or um, they don't know how to behave right or they need to up their medication. No, it's more about making sure that, um, number one, we develop a different perspective about disabilities and serving students who do have challenges with their disabilities and also um, including, actually creating an inclusive environment where we're not um, ostracizing the kid or um, not meeting their needs or keeping them at the basic level of learning just because we don't understand how to move on. The last thing I want to touch on is teacher, teachers' reactions. Wow, this is a big um, area, I think, especially education, especially within schools. It says when teachers take on the challenge of making their classrooms and schools more inclusive, they become more skillful and better practitioners. This means that all pupils benefit, not just those with special needs. Statements of rights and government policies may set aims, but it is individual teachers who can make inclusive education a success or a failure. They too can hold negative attitudes just as others do in society. Um, often their fears and prejudices are based on a lack of contact with people who are disabled or who have disadvantaged backgrounds. So I'm going to say that a lot of times what happens, especially with students who don't have a physical disability, is that we may, um, I'm going to say unconsciously, have bias towards 
the student, especially if we think that their disability is not really a disability. For example, emotionally disturbed students oftentimes, or those who have um, the authority, dis I forgot the, the correct terminology for it, but they, um, they often react negatively to authority, um, which is a form of their emotional behavior, emotional behavior disorder. Uh, sometimes that's challenging. I've had a couple situations where I've had students literally try to bully me um, or when they were feeling emotionally um, unstable, they often lashed out in a way that did seem like it was not, um, you know, something that was a disability or labeled as something as a disability. But upon further, um, you know, examination, I realized that the student may not have been diagnosed with emotional behavior disorder, but them having uh, opposition towards authority um, meant that I needed to handle the student in a different way. And the student did have emotional behavior disorder. However, knowing how to handle a student who is going to be aggressive towards you because you are authority figure, knowing how to not trigger behaviors and knowing what to do when those behaviors are triggered it has a lot to do with the teacher and their uh, beliefs and also their attitude towards serving these students. And when we factor in other um, conditions or other realities that it could be uh, related to race, social class, um, just all other dynamics, grade level, um, preparedness, it just gets to be very sticky. So I would say to start the conversation, um, know where you are as it relates to the conversation of disabilities in an inclusive classroom and address those shortcomings or start to unravel those gaps. Because like I said, I didn't know that I would be challenged by the student who had opposition towards authority and had emotional um, behavior or emotional um, behavior disorders through that way. But when it happened to me, I really had to self-evaluate and kind of think of how I was addressing a student because I would trigger him. And I didn't even take the time to think about how I was um, adding to the problem. So to wrap up this unit really quickly, um, there's a video for you to watch. It's called Teaching in the Inclusive Classroom. It has uh, different examples and different school settings. Please take a look at it. Uh, you will enjoy, especially with all the different examples that are uh, available to you. Um, this concludes the last slide. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. And I look forward to continuing the course with you. Have a fantastic start to your week.